All right, so we want to look at functions from um, a higher dimensional space to a lower dimensional space, which are continuously differentiable and prove that they're not one to one. So for A, we're just going to look at the case where we have a function from R2 to R. So um, if D1F of XY, or Rather, if d1f is equal to 0 for all points in R2, i.e. if d1f of xy equals 0 for all x and y, um, and of course here 0, I don't mean the number 0, but the 0 linear operator, linear function. So if this is the case, then f is not 1 to 1. And why is that? That's because well, if you choose any x1 not equal to x2, and you look at um, f of x1 comma y, and compare it to f of x2 comma y, well, if the um, if d1 f is zero everywhere, then f has to be constant with respect to the first variable, um, i.e., it's independent of the first variable, and so then. Um, f of x1, y will be equal to f of x2, y for all x1 and x2 and r, and so it's not one to one. Okay, so instead assume, what's that beeping? Oh well. So I'd assume that there exists some point x, y such that d1 f of x, y equals zero. Okay, and so here is sort of the first um, thing that I'm not entirely sure about with this problem. So the hint says to suppose that d1f of xy is non-zero for all xy in some open set A. But what we're going to what we're going to do is we're going to um, apply um, we're going to apply the inverse function theorem at x, y. And we will only need d1 of f of x, y to be non-zero. Oh, wait. This should be non-zero. So we, we're going to need to apply the inverse function theorem, and so we're going to need d, and so we're going to need this to be non-zero only at the point x, y, because um, for or the determinant of this matrix to be non-zero only at the point, only at a particular point. And so um, I don't think we absolutely need d1 f of x y to be non-zero in a neighborhood or in some open set A. I think all we need is for it to be non-zero at some particular point, but I'm not entirely sure if this is the case. What's going to end up happening is that um, by inverse function, well, yeah, I'm not sure. I might be making a mistake here because I'm not assuming everything that the problem says that I should assume, but if there is a mistake, I can't see it, or I don't see it at the moment. So anyway, so define g of x, y as in the problem statement. So it's going to be f of x, y, and then y. Here. So then given g as above in the problem statement, what we're going to have is we can compute the determinant of g prime of x comma y. So this is going to be the determinant of the matrix d1 f of x y d and then d1 y and then d2 f of x y and then d2 y. So this determinant we don't know what anything in the top row is We knew, do know in the bottom row we've got 0 and we've got 1. So now if we take this determinant, um, we're going to get d1f of xy minus 0 times d2f of xy. So this is going to be d1f of xy 
which we have assumed is not equal to zero. Thus, by the inverse function theorem, which is um, theorem 2-11, g is um, or g has a continuous and differentiable inverse on some open set A. And of course A must contain the point x, y. So we do end up using a point, uh, we do end up using an open set A like they say in the problem statement. I just don't think that it necessarily needs to be the case that d1 f of x, y is non-zero on all of A. This might end up being a consequence um, because of how invertible functions are, but um, I don't think it's absolutely necessary. Um, or at least, yeah, it's not necessary for the proof. So yeah, um, so we have this. So by exercise, how do you, sp how do I, sp wow, exercise, exercise? Yeah, by exercise 2-3-6, the previous exercise, g of a is open. So that's actually the only reason the only reason that we need the inverse function theorem here is not that we're not doing anything with this continuous and differentiable inverse of g. All we're doing is we're using the previous exercise to show that we have the image of a being open. Okay. So Thus, since g of a, well certainly this contains g of x, y because x, y is an a, and g of x, y equals f of x, y, comma y, then, okay, so we have this point f of x, y, comma y, which is in g of a, and so then there must be some other point f of x comma y, or f of x y comma y tilde, which is distinct from f of x y comma y, but which is also in g of a. So there is some y tilde which is not equal to y, such that f of x y y tilde is in g of a. And this is true because f of x y comma y is not on the boundary of g of a, and so you have to be able to move, you have to be able to adjust one of the coordinates just a little bit, but, and still remain in this open set g of a. Okay, so f of x, y comma y tilde is in g of a. So if it's in g of a, then it's the image of some point under g. So this means that there exists some x1 comma x, or x1, y1, such that f of x, y, comma, y tilde is precisely equal to g of x1, comma, y1. But what's the formula for g of x1, comma, y1? It's f of x1, y1, and then y1. Okay, so these two vectors are equal, so each individual coordinate is equal. So in particular, we first have y tilde equals y1, and then we have f of x, y is equal to f of x1, y1, which is equal to f of x1, comma, y tilde. But y is not equal to y tilde, and so the points x, y, and x1, comma, y tilde cannot be equal. It is possible that x is equal to x1, but it cannot be possible that y is equal to y tilde. So since y is not equal to y tilde, we have two distinct points which map to the same point under f, and so f is not invertible. Or no, it is not one to one. 
and that's what we wanted to prove for part A, and so we're done. And so now we move on to part B, and I'm going to be honest, I didn't do this one. I was reading through this, and this is probably something that's like within my mental capacity to do, but um, I don't know, I just spent long enough working on it and trying to work out the details um, that bas basically the, this, the, the ideas of the proof can be found elsewhere, and I, like, I had to resort to looking this up, so I looked it up. Oh, this will also be an example to see if the, uh, if, uh, flux, um, affects the app. Because, yeah, it should be taking effect now. Anyways, okay, so here's what I found. Um, I found this thread on Stack Exchange, Math Stack Exchange, which is talking about this problem, and specifically Part B. Um... And it looks like there's not too difficult of a solution, which is using the um, something called the constant rank theorem. And apparently this is a generalization of the inverse function theorem. And it sounds like even if applying this more general theorem isn't necessary, what this what part B boils down to is proving a special case of this, um, proving a special case of this, um, whatever, it's constant rank theorem. And so the point of the exercise is to make you think about the constant rank theorem in that case, I believe. So assuming that is the case, um, the link that they show here is dead, but you can still look up constant rank theorem and you can find it, and this guy... Pierre something um, went ahead and typed this up, and it looks really nice, and it's pretty short. Um, and so, yeah, you can basically go through this and um, get it from here. Now, of course, this constant rank theorem is more general, because here F is a CP map, mean, meaning that it is, it had, so a CP map, is a function which has p continuous derivatives. So for us, a function which is continuously differentiable, i.e. it has a derivative and its derivative is continuous, that is a C1 map. So that's why I've written p equals 1 here. Um, and the CP diffeomorphism is a function which has p continuous derivatives and which is invertible. Um, so here, a C1 diffeomorphism would just be a continuously differentiable and invertible map. Okay, so, or, I think that's it. But yeah, so I started reading through this, um, and I sort of got stuck reading through this proof. We can assume that if you take the derivative of F1, with respect to the first r variables, and you can prove that, in, or you can assume that's invertible. I wonder if this is because the it has rank r, so the range has dimension r, so you can sort of take the r variables that map into. I don't know. Actually, no. I, I just straight up don't know why this is. And I feel like this is something which is not difficult, because typically when you have a, a one-sentence thing like this, it's something that's easy. Um, but I don't see why it's easy, and I was just sort of hitting my head against a wall, figuratively trying to figure this out. And so, um, instead of doing that, I figure I'm just straight up not going to do it. So... I apologize for that, this is like the first time that um, I'm doing something like this, but also, I don't know, this, because this, this, um, this seems like a very sort of abstract result, and I don't quite see the usefulness in it, and so that makes it difficult 
for me to get the motivation to actually do it. Um, which is odd, because I guess there's a lot of exercises I do in real analysis that a lot of people would think aren't very well motivated, but I find them, for some reason, inherently interesting. Um, but this one, not, not so much for whatever reason. Um, and so, yeah, I just decided I'm going to give you all the resources that you need in order to prove this theorem. Um, but unfortunately, I can't really walk you through it. Because um, the, the other thing is, like, the, this sentence here that I don't understand, this sort of comes back down to the why, the, the reason that I do this YouTube channel in the first place, is that, like, math is something where, at least for me personally, um, the most efficient way for me to learn something is to discuss with someone. So... Basically, what I could do is I could just sit here um, for some unknown period of time. It could be anywhere from like five minutes to a number of hours trying to figure out why we can assume that this derivative isn't, that this Jacobian thing or eh, derivative is invertible for all points. Or I could ask someone, or because this seems to be something which is pretty straightforward, I could ask someone who understands it why it's true, and they'd be like, oh, it's because blah, 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 and I'd be like, oh, of course, that's obvious. Um, which is a very common thing in math. Um, things which are obvious once you realize them can take a long time to remember if you're just sort of blinking out or something. Um, so yeah, hopefully in other videos I will be able to go into, continue to go into as much detail as I do so that I can sort of like explain the, um, the small nuances and explain why things are as obvious as the proofs say that they are. But here I don't really have, I can't interact with this writing of the constant rank theorem. Okay, I've been rambling for a while, so I'm going to end the video. But yeah, so again, here's the constant rank theorem. And here is how you can use the constant rank theorem to prove the exercise. Although it seems like this write-up isn't really, um, is more of an outline. Um, it's, it seems like it might just be like a, um, a straightforward application of the constant rank theorem. Um, but anyways... If you're able to sort of construct a proof from these ingredients, then you will be able to solve part B, and then that will finish the exercise.